Okay, so hi everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for coming along. Sorry, first she's about the clash. Um, I tried my best to make okay. it at the time and then it just popped up. Um, but although we aren't gathered at the one place, I feel like it is still really important for us to do an acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. For me, I am on a Gundjamara um, land. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, like I said, thank you so much for coming along today um, and really big thank you and instruction to Lauren Day from Rural Workforce Agency Victoria, who is going to be taking us through the JFPP um, program um, and a bit about the application process. Um, and then we're going to have a couple of second years, so Monica, Kevin and myself just chatting about our experiences from the program as well. Um, so, just a few bits of housekeeping. If everyone can just turn their microphones off. Um, while each respective person's chatting just to try and limit any kind of feedback that we get. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, just chuck them up in the chat, uh, little chat feature, um, and Lauren will do a presentation and then she'll come back out and look at the chat bar and see if there's anything that she didn't cover, she can address them then. Um, and this is gonna be uh, recorded just because, um, to make sure that everyone can kind of get the information. So please pass that on to anyone that you know is interested and missed out on today. Um, yeah, so may as well get started. So um, if you're ready to go, Lauren, that would be great. Um, and thank you so much for coming along and filling us in. No worries. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks so much, everyone, for being here today. Um, as I said, um, well, as Edwina said, my name's Lauren Day and I'm the Future Workforce Program Officer with the Rural Workforce Agency Victoria, um, otherwise known as R-Wave. Um, so just a reminder to make sure that your microphones are on mute, please. Uh, the plan for this presentation is to give you a bit of an overview first about who R-Wave is and why we're actually relevant to students. And then I'll also give you the rundown on the John Clinton Placement Program. Um, like Edwina said, we're going to keep questions to the end. There might be some Google form questions for us to look at. So I'll look at those first and then anything that's in the um, chat box, I'll address that afterwards. Um, all of the John Flynn Placement Program contact details will be provided to you at the end of the presentation. So if you have any further questions, feel free to um, hit that up and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. First up, um, the Rural Workforce Agency Victoria is a not-for-profit government-funded organisation. It designs, delivers and creates sustainable health workforce programs and models that support rural, regional and Aboriginal communities. We're all about getting health professionals working in rural and regional Victoria because, as I'm sure you're all aware, we are very desperate for doctors, nurses and allied health professionals in these locations. Um, we'll move on now to uh, how our way of actually support students. I'll just let you know that unfortunately, like a lot of you might be, I'm working with just one tiny little laptop screen. So it's actually really hard for me to jump in and um, read my notes and also read the chat box. So if there is anything like the sound not working, just jump onto your microphone and let me know. Um, so how does our way of support students? We work closely with rural health clubs to bring you sessions like this along with career days and anything else that we can assist with. We offer grants such as our Rural Clinical Placement Grants and Victorian Rural Health Conference Grants, along with promotion and leadership grants. We also offer grants that give students the opportunity to attend health events as rural ambassadors, along with Rural Experience Day Outs and Aboriginal Cultural Safety Training. We work with the University Rural Health Schools by facilitating regular catch-ups between the coordinators to share ideas and identify collaboration opportunities along with risks and challenges. How can we actually support your future career? Our wave recruit doctors for positions in rural and remote clinics around Victoria. We recruit fellow doctors for locum positions. We facilitate professional development opportunities and we administer the Health Workforce Scholarship Program. This program offers grants and bursaries to health professionals who are working in rural and remote regions to attend conferences for further study or sort of short conferences or short events, things like that. Um, so there are things just to keep in mind. I know it's a long way away for a lot of you. 
but when you are sort of in that position and you're working in these um, rural locations, which you hopefully will do in the future, um, we can actually be a really good um, support to you. Let's move on to the John Flynn Postman Program. Um, this right here is John Flynn. Some fun facts about John Flynn include that he is obviously um, very famous for establishing the aerial medical service known today as the Royal Flying Doctors Service. He actually trained as a teacher, but went on to practice as a Presbyterian minister. And if you didn't know this, he features on the Australian $20 note. John Flynn was posted to a rural mission north of Adelaide where he gained an understanding of the difficulties faced by people who live in the outback and thus the Royal, and thus the Royal Flying Doctors Service was actually born. Now I did have a, another video for you but I fear that the sound's not going to work again so I might just tell you a little bit about this. Um, if anyone has actually been to the Royal Flying Doctors Museum, you may have seen this full presentation. Um, it's called John Flynn the Hol Hologram and presents John Flynn as a life-size character as he takes you through his journey to establishing the Royal Flying Doctors Service. The clip I was going to show you was just a bit of a snapshot to give you an idea of sort of, you know, their depiction of how it all came to be and a bit of information about the... Um, uh, planes and things, um, but it's not super important, it's just a bit of interest. Um, but one of the most fantastic parts of these, of this clip, is actually the testimonials from patients who would have otherwise likely died if it was not for the um, Royal Flying Doctor Service. One of the best stories is actually from a farmer who had a four-wheeler accident while tending to his cattle in remote Queensland. Several years after the RFDS had collected him from the accident and pretty much saved his life mid-air, he told the story of actually seeing the nurse who had been on his flight at the local pub. And he sort of talks about the fact that he remembers asking if he could give her a hug because he actually recognised her. So all of those years later, and despite the fact that um, he was in quite a state at the time that he he was on the flight, he could still remember this nurse and wanted to thank her. Um, it's those sorts of stories that I think really highlight the importance that rural doctors, doctors and services such as the RFGS make in the lives of rural remote Australians and hopefully it's why students like you are interested in going and working in these sorts of locations because you're just so needed. What is the John Flynn Placement Program? The JFPP aims to build connections and engagement with a community in addition to providing students with an immersive experience in, rural, in a rural or remote context. Um, by undertaking a series of placements in the same community over an extended period, students will gain first-hand experience of what it's like to live and work in rural Australia. It is an initiative of the Australian Government Department of Health. It's designed to attract the future workforce, uh, workforce into a remote or rural career. It's administered by the Rural Workforce Agency Network. Obviously, I manage the program in Victoria. The program is designed for medical students and provides the opportunity to experience rural um, practice and lifestyle in remote and rural locations across Australia. How does it all work? Well, once you're accepted onto the program, you'll be allocated a state. You do get to pop in a preference to where you'd like to go. We can't always um, follow your preference, but we will try as much as we can. The Rural Workforce Agency in whatever state you do get allocated to will manage the on-ground logistical elements of your placement. And then the lead agency, who are Health Workforce Queensland, they will manage any of those higher up sorts of um, elements such as booking your flights, etc. The Rural Workforce Agency will pair you with a mentor and if possible, a host and a community contact in that community. You must complete eight weeks, so 56 nights over three to four years. Each placement block must be no less than 14 nights. You can travel intrastate or interstate for your JFPP placement. And you need to keep in mind that these placements must be at least 14 nights in length, but they can actually be as long as you and your mentor agree upon. So for instance, you can choose to do a three or four week placement if it suits you and your mentor and your community contact and your host, but you can't just do one week in placement. 
So the JFPP placements are not designed to provide the same level and degree of clinical experience as a university accredited clinical placement. It's really important to note that they, they are supposed to be quite different from the placements that you would do with university. Scholars are not expected to complete specified clinical experiences or assignments. So that's how they sort of differ from your university placements. And there's no expectation that mentors will teach or supervise particular clinical skills. The mentor's role is all about showing the life and work of a rural medical practitioner and to facilitate clinical and rural experiences for the scholar. So it's really more of a much broader um, understanding of how rural experience um, actually works. To encourage you to fully immerse yourself into the rural life, you'll be placed with a host and community contact if there is one available in your region. We can't always place people with a host and community contact. If we can't give you one or the other, we'll try at least getting you one. If we can't get you any of them, then unfortunately you do have to stay in commercial accommodation. Um, Occasionally this does happen, but we really try to limit that as much as we can. Um, it, if you do have a host, you will stay at the host's home and your community contact will be your liaison for the community. They'll show you around, take you to events, those sorts of things. Your host or community contact is there to give you an insight into the social and cultural aspects of living in a remote and rural community. So you might go down to the footy sheds on Friday night or you might go to whatever sort of if they're having a bonfire night or whatever's sort of happening in the community at the time, hopefully they'll be able to take you along. Um, if your hosts want to, they can also act as your community contact and vice versa. If a host or community contact is not available, for your first placement, we do encourage you when you go down there to actually explore the community and scope possibilities for your next placement. So if you do meet people while you're down there, you could potentially talk to them about, um, you know, acting as your host and community contact for your next uh, placement. If you're considering a career in rural or remote location, the benefits of participating in this program are immense. You'll learn firsthand from experienced rural medical practitioners. You'll be afforded the opportunity to establish long-term relationships with rural doctors, communities and residents. You'll get to see the diversity of work that rural clinical practice entails. You'll be taking a significant step on the pathway towards a rural medical career. Uh, you'll be able to network with long-serving and experienced medical practitioners and experience rural life and what a rural community has to offer, as well as being part of a well-known and highly respected rural placement program. And obviously the whole point of the program is to help to contribute to overcoming the rural health workforce shortage and mal distribution across those areas. So it's just the benefits are huge for everyone. So who is eligible to, eligible to apply? Um, you're eligible to apply if you comply with the following um, stipulations. First up, you need to be an Australian citizen or permanent resident. New Zealand citizens residing permanently in, in Australia are also eligible to apply. You need to be enrolled in an accredited medical program at one of the participating universities. You need to be able to complete the 56 nights of placement within three to four years. It's really important that you understand what that means. Um, for a lot of students, it means that the breaks that you get, so your um, end of year um, semester breaks and those mid-year breaks, that's when you'll be participating in the program and you'll be going out on placement. So you need to be really sure that you're willing to make those sorts of sacrifices. Um, the program is absolutely fantastic, but we do find that some students uh, sort of forget the fact that they will, a lot of their downtime they will be spending in these rural communities. So you really do need to have a passion for it. You must be able to complete placements, as I said, in your university breaks and have at least three years of study remaining. Now, any student who is on a, any other sort of um, scholarship scheme, you'll need to check your eligibility at the jfpp.com.au because some people who are on other scholarship schemes might not be eligible. Before you apply, please note that the JFPP is 
unique in that it promotes independence. So you will be required to organise the dates of your placement yourself. Therefore, the program promotes ongoing interaction between you, the JFPP team, and once established, your mentor and community contact and host. It's important to understand that once you've got those relationships established, you are in charge of calling up all of your contacts and arranging all of those dates. The JFPP program don't manage any of that. You just get back to us and let, you, let us know. In the first instance, we will make sure we organise all of those arrangements and make sure and put you in touch with your mentor community contact and host, but going forward, it'll be up to you. Before your initial placement, you must complete an orientation and induction into the program. You must also complete the necessary cultural orientation plan. After each placement, you're required to complete a post placement evaluation survey, as well as um, an evaluation survey that's required at the after your final placement. Um, after each placement, you are encouraged to submit a placement journal of your experience, both prefer, um, professionally and personally. And as you can see listed on the screen there, there are several compliance documents that you will also be required to submit. All applicants will be required to submit an online application form through the self-service portal accessed by the JFPP website. Please note the applications cannot be saved. So you must be completing them in one session, in one session or sitting. The minimum anticipated time frame to complete the application is two hours. The first stage of the application will determine students' eligibility for the program. Applicants who do not meet the eligibility requirements will not be able to proceed to the next stage of the online application. The second stage of the application will require students to answer questions that will comprise of a 400 to 500 word essay. The application questions are designed to determine an applicant's intention to practice rurally after graduation. It's really important to understand that these placements should not be seen as a holiday or a break or an opportunity to sort of go and see a different town. Um, it really is all about capturing those people who are really keen to make a difference in rural locations and are interested in working in those rural locations once they have um, completed their studies. So those questions really are designed to pinpoint the people who are actually very serious about these sorts of, um, the, about the issues in those areas, but are also really keen to learn a bit more and to understand uh, how they can be of assistance in those areas. Um, if you are applying for the Northern Territory, so if you state that that's an area that you would like to go and uh, do your placement in, the application process is slightly different um, in that uh, once you're sort of looked at in the second round, um, it involves a phone interview to get you through to the final stage. Uh, for specifics regarding how applicants' answers are ranked, please refer to the JFPP website. It's quite sort of... Um, it's very detailed about how what rankings are actually put onto what answers. So it's better off if you're interested in that to just go straight to the website and actually look at those um, details yourself. These here are the dates for applying in 2020. Um, so the big one to know is that the at the end of this month, um, applications will open and then applications will close as of the 6th of May. So you've got two weeks to get those in. So it sounds like you might be keen or if you're, this is something that you're interested in, please head to the website and read all of the guidelines and the reviews um, from past and present students. It's really important to be as informed about the process and the program as possible before applying, just to make sure that you really are the right person. It's important to understand that we get over 300 applications a year. Uh, so it's, it is very competitive and it's important that you make sure that it's the right choice for you. You can apply via the website and follow the John Flynn Placement Program socials. So they'll post any updates on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You'll be able to get all the information there. And sadly, once again, we had the, another video here just to tell you a little, give you a bit of an understanding about um, what it's like to go and do work in a rural location. A physiotherapist, so obviously he's not someone who would have participated in the John Flynn Placement Program. Uh, but he 
recently graduated and went out and worked in a rural location. Um, and he just talks about his experience and it's, it's very similar to what you'll experience if you go out for placements. So it can be quite interesting. I'll get Edwina to, when we do post this uh, presentation, we'll pop the links for these um, videos at the bottom, just so you can have them. Um, and otherwise that's the presentation done for today. My apologies for the videos, that's a shame. Um, but I'll just jump over to Edwina now to see if we did have any questions that came through for Google Forms? Um, no, nothing no. has come through. I just checked before. Um, Excellent. Does anyone have any questions that they want to um, chat in the group chat before um, us JFPP students have a bit of a chat about our experiences? Um, and if you do, um, I'm going to start off, but if you still have questions, when myself, Kevin or Monica chat, just put them up there and we'll try and answer them as well. Um, so I'm going to give sharing my screen a go. Yeah, so I've just got a question from Taylor there. Um, yep. Yes, placement must be done within the four years of study. So generally what would happen is you might be in your first year of study this year, you will uh, be accepted onto the program by sort of August is the sort of when we'll start doing all of those um, orientation and induction things. So I'll just go back to those dates. So you'd know about whether or not you were on the program um, by outcome of application would be by June and then July, August is when orientation and induction happens. And then we need to actually place you with a mentor. That can take a little while. Um, so potentially you wouldn't do your first placement until the December semester break. But sometimes we can have issues actually getting mentors. So you might not actually get the opportunity to do your first placement until the you know, mid semester break the following year. So that's why you need to decide if it's something that's really uh, important to you, because it can mean that you need to uh, sort of cram some of your um, holidays and things together in order to complete all of the placement time that's required. Um, and just on that, guys, I know compared to other universities, our holidays are not super nice with only having like one week breaks during the year. Um, so I know past Deacon students have kind of taken a week out of first week of semester um, and that um, so like gone in the middle break and I had had my placement planned for the June break and the first week of second semester that's been cancelled for obvious reasons. Um, but like I sat down with my unit chair and had those kind of conversations and um, yeah, so that it is tough for us and it's not encouraged that we go over our uni time. And I know Lauren's mentioned that, but, um, but that is why if you do want to be a part of it, it is about making sure that you're prepared to kind of catch up on the work if you do miss a week of class. Um, just thought I'd mention that. Um, I've just I... posted in here, sorry, Edwina, That's just right. someone was asking about where the locations are. So I've just posted a link in the chat there to the Doctor Connect website, which will tell you which modified Monash model um, locations are available. So you can go anywhere between an MM2 to 7 location. Um, if you open up that website, you'll be able to see that you can, um, you can see which, where the uh, if a location that you might have in mind, you can pop it in there and then search it. It will tell you if it fits into that criteria. Um, it's all dependent though on where we have uh, willing and able mentors. So that can sometimes mean that you can't necessarily get a location that you'd like to, but any location that's an MM2 to 7 location is where you'd be getting sent. Wonderful. Um, okay, can I, um, I've got my screen shared. Can you just give me a thumbs up if you guys can see my screen, my PowerPoint? Ah, perfect. Thanks, Monica. Um, I'll try and keep it brief, but you probably all know that I do like talking. Um, so my placement was in the Northern Territory, um, Kaltaka Jara or um, Docker River. It's quite affectionately known from the locals, which is that little red dot. So quite smack bam in the middle of our country. Um, so Lauren has actually mentioned this, um, that the application was slightly different. So post making my application, I then got shortlisted and had to have a phone interview um, just because there's only about 20 or so to 30 spots in the NT with over, with a much, 
many more people kind of wanting to get those spots. They have to do a phone interview to kind of screen you, um, accepted. And then our first placement block is kind of pre-allocated to us. Um, that's just purely because we have to go and have a, um, a bit of a cultural immersion before um, being able to go out onto community. Um, and it's been mentioned a few times, but differences in the NT program is um, you're not going to have a community mentor out in those remote Indigenous communities. So you do stay at clinic accommodation and depending on your community that can be shared accommodation or um, for myself, I was staying in a little um, self-contained unit that visiting clinicians normally stay in. And then again, GPs aren't that common out in those really remote communities. Um, not many of them have a permanent GP. Some of them have visiting GPs, so I didn't have a GP. So that's, I was with the remote area nurses out there. Um, and like I mentioned, a three day cultural immersion was in Alice Springs. Um, part of that is we got to go visit Purple House, which it's a bad photo, but that's a um, Purple House um, dialysis bus. A second years, we learned about this last year in cultural immersion. I don't know if you first years will hear about it, um, but we got to have a tour of that and see the dialysis bus. And they just purchased a second one. So we got to check that out too, which is really exciting. Um, so getting there, um, it's about 700 k's west of Alice Springs and it was 11 and a half hour bush bus ride for me. Um, and that was running perfectly on time with no problems. Sometimes it takes up to 15 hours, um, but it runs twice a week. So they drive out, they stay the night community and drive back into Alice the next day. And it's really essential. It's how pathology gets from community to Alice Springs and it's how drugs and supplies and mail gets from Alice Springs to community. So it's a really essential service as well as um, transporting people between communities in Central Australia. Um, really awesome, we got to go right up into the Uluru National Park, right, uh, basically drove around the rock because there's a community called Mitajulu at the base of the rock. So that was really awesome and lots of really, really cool sites, even though most of it was just desert. Um, and the last 200 Ks was on this corrugated, like bumpy um, 200 Ks on that, which was nice and interesting. I felt like I had sea legs when I got off the bus. Um, as for the facilities, this is how it kind of looks from the outside, quite basic. So there was two remote area nurses and a clinic manager who's also nurse trained and two of them are on call each night um, and they're absolute bosses, like absolutely anything can walk through those doors um, and they're prepared and ready to go, which is really, really awesome. Um, so we had a bit of an emergency room, a fully stocked pharmacy, an off-road ambulance. Purple House actually have a dialysis unit, which is the um, shed on the right hand of the picture, which has two dialysis nurses um, dedicated to that as well. There is an aged care facility out in Docker River and uh, we would do visits there for certain patients. Um, and we had visiting specialists. So when I was there, the mental health team flew in for a day, pharmacist flew in for a day and the GP that comes out and visits was there for about three days as well. So they fly in and fly out. Um, so day to day, the clinic ran nine to four, pretty standard. Eight o'clock started with the staff meeting. Um, the, pro, the, the computer program or system that they have in the NT, um, they get recalls and alerts each morning about certain patients that need to come in for maybe like monthly injections or a 12 month checkup or those sorts of things. And we kind of chat about what could come through the door and try to prepare for the day. Um, there's not set appointments per se out there um, that doesn't really work within those communities. So it's more about just um, if there's someone that's quite urgent that needs to be seen, we will go out, um, drive out into community and go and pick them up and bring them into community if, if they're willing, of course, um, just because mobility and the heat, it's not very like friendly for people to want to walk across town to come to clinic. Um, and then I've just put there Friday, we didn't have any administration or cleaners or anything like that. So Friday afternoons always had to be blocked out for all of those kind of safety checks. Um, as for what I did, I spent a lot of time in the pharmacy, just helping out, unpacking um, deliveries from the bush bus or packing the boxes for the aged care um, clients as well. And just doing out of date checks, all that sort of stuff, which was quite good to get to know all the different um, medications. Um, Everyone gets their vital signs checked from blood glucose, blood hemoglobin, all of your standard vitals, just as we know, chronic conditions are quite prevalent out there. So we got very, very practiced at that. Got to do some wound dressing and got to learn to take blood, which was really exciting. Cause as Lauren mentioned, it isn't necessarily about us being taught specific clinical skills, um, but that was um, my, the nurse on day one said that I had to learn it. So she was willing to show me. Um, and just helped out with the reception and administration a bit too, because they're so under the pump out there. So anything that I could kind of do to just make their day a bit easier, um, I tried to do that. 
As for community life, there wasn't really much going on. It was about 47 degrees most days. Um, people don't really come out in that. You see them about 8 a.m. and you see people about 5 p.m. and not many in between. Um, and it's the time of year, the population's really, really low. Everyone kind of goes to other family members and other communities that might live near water or in just cooler regions and smack bam in the middle. Um, so there wasn't really many community events going on um, that normally happen through winter. So it was a lot of downtime by myself. Um, that's okay. I feel like I'm well practiced for this situation at the moment. Um, and the nurses were nice enough to take me on a few afternoon drives just to see the area. So this is me being all touristy. That is the ambulance, off-road ambulance. Um, and I'm at the Northern Territory WA border. Uh, a day before I got there, for some reason, they took down the welcome to WA sign. And I was really sad because I couldn't get a photo in front of it. Um, but I still uh, got to have a look at the sites. Um, things I saw, so uh, fitting, John Flynn started RFDS. Lauren spoke about it at the start. Um, I'm really interested in RFDS. It was really, really exciting to see that in full swing. We had three different evacuations in the couple of weeks that I was there. Um, this is our day airstrip, which was just set along that mountain range. Um, we were evac a sepsis patient, um, but at night we don't have lights. So we have to drive an hour and a half across the WA border to another community. Um, we had a patient going pretty deeply into heart failure at the time, struggling to breathe. So that was quite scary, I guess. That hour and a half drive, anything can kind of happen and you're just in a little four wheeler. But anyway, that it was really exciting to kind of see that kind of happen. Um, not exciting, it's the wrong word, but interesting to see that happen. And we also had a lady go into early labor. So normally out there, it, um, they go into Alice Springs, what they call sit down about three weeks before they are due to give birth and accommodation and appointments all sorted for them. Um, but this lady presented with early labor signs. It is something that um, is often spoken about, trying to encourage um, us being able to support women giving birth on country. And it is a big thing that um, they're really pushing for um, because that would be ideal. But at the same time, the clinic doesn't have the equipment to support um, you know, early births or difficult births. And they've had a few neonatal deaths in the past. And so it is something that they're really trying to be able to implement programs and systems and training in place to really not have to send people into Alice, but that's at the moment how they have to do things. Um, and just saw a lot of chronic conditions. We know that that's really prevalent in Indigenous communities. Um, I think the scariest thing was I saw a 10 year old boy with a blood glucose of 22 and that was considered normal for him, um, which was very like shocking and like kind of hit home how different it is out there. Um, a lot of rheumatic heart disease, which is um, kind of said doesn't exist in Australia, which is really, really wrong. It's really rampant in our Indigenous communities. And it's really like those injections they have to get three weekly are really, really harsh and quite upsetting to have to see people get so often. Um, and there's a lot of iron deficiency out there as well. Just, we you know, social determinants, um, the stock in those communities and the, and the food available. Um, so it was a lot of kind of like slightly confronting things to see and we learn about them and we hear about them in new first years. We'll hear about it a lot in your cultural immersion next week. Um, but it's a different thing experiencing it firsthand, but it just makes, I feel like I have a much greater appreciation for, the, for it, I guess. Um, so my main takeaways, these are my donkeys that lived outside of my um, um, house. One of them was really nasty and would chase me, but the other one always wanted pats. So that was always a fun little challenge to come home to. Um, seems a bit ironic, but just think about how you will go in isolation. Um, it's not so much the physical isolation, like I spent weekends two days straight by myself inside because it was too hot to leave. Um, and it's not safe to kind of walk around out there in that heat. Um, but it's meant, it was mentally quite isolating in terms of you see a lot and you feel a lot and you see things firsthand and sometimes you, you're debating in your head, you can see the pros and cons for certain things and seeing all of how much worse their health is as well is quite confronting. Um, but that's exactly like, I think, why it's an invaluable experience. And I really wish that all of you would, um, every medical student could have that experience because that's really how you learn and become much more appreciative and understanding of that. So it, that was the challenge, but it's exactly what I wanted out of the experience and exactly what made my experience just, um, yeah, invaluable. And I'm really, really excited to go back. So um, if that interests you at all, I hope I didn't deter anyone or 
talk for too long, but um, yeah, so I really encourage anyone to apply for NT because I think that it's just, it was a phenomenal experience. I'm really excited to go for my next couple of placements. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just check. Cool. Um, Monica, she's also been on a placement as well. So, oh, Kevin, no, Kevin, did you want to go? Sorry. Sorry, everyone. What? Yeah, I think Monica wanted me to go first, so I'll try okay. to go first. Let me try to figure out how to share the screen. Is my microphone okay? Yep. Awesome. So, um, so I, I, compared to, um, I guess, Edwina's experience, mine was, I guess, much more privileged. So I, I feel weird talking about mine because it's just definitely not as, like, I guess, as epic as Edwina's. But in a different sense, um, I went to this wonderful little town known as Mount Isa. And it's in Queensland, so it's kind of borderlining Queensland and Northern Territory. But um, as you expect from a Queensland town, it was very hot and humid and dry and hot and humid and hot. So um, fun little place. I hated the weather, but fun little place. If you can see from this wonderful image I stole off Google, um, the heart of the town is really centered around this sort of mining facility. So the population sort of reflected that. So we had a lot of like fly in, fly out workers, same as Edwina. But um, on top of that, we had quite a substantial indigenous population too. But otherwise, um, I was going to call it necessity, but I guess much more, it's much more of a privilege now. But um, Mount Isa had all what I consider necessity. So your Mac gears, your KFC, your Hungry Jack. And they were a bit of a relief considering some days are bad days. So it's good to have some sort of comfort food options every now and then too. But once again, it's a luxury now that I can compare it to Edwina's experience. Um, so I was allocated to the Mount Isa Medical Center. And this was um, shattering predominantly Dr. Michael, going to butcher his surname, Value. But um, it was a private clinic. Um, it, I was there for five days a week, about 8.30 to 8 o'clock. On some days, it um, started actually at 7. So it's about 12, 13 hour days, which were quite huge. Otherwise, I did have the option of shadowing a few other doctors, as well as an orthopedic surgeon. And there was a Mount Isa Hospital. But um, because I, I would follow Dr. Michael the most, it was quite a textbook GP experience. And what I mean by that is I feel like if you haven't done your first year GP placement, and I, I do know a lot of them may have been cancelled, but it's a lot of observations of just seeing the GP do his thing. So it's observations on observations on observations. However, however, like when the second day hit and once the trust was established, he let me take the reins on some history taking, clinical examinations, you know, putting stuff in the electronic medical record, which is cool. Once again, like Edwina, also learning stuff that you would have learned in second year, trying venipuncture. A lot of fun. I missed the vein twice, but you know, you win some, you lose some. But um, it was also, although it, I call it a textbook GP experience, it's really textbook rural. Because with rural, I find that it's very, it's an environment which is all hands on deck and mishaps are bound to happen. So one of the days, um, one of the doors actually broke and it trapped both a nurse and a patient inside for three hours. So we took turns, different doctors, different nurses, just hammering at this door, trying to get it free. And the patients are sitting in the waiting room next to us. And we'll just be like, you know, we'll see you guys soon. We're just going to try to figure this out. And it was just like, it was cool to see not only just me giving it a go to, but seeing all the doctors and everyone really chip in and try to figure out like just random mishaps that can occur. But um, of course, JFPP is not really centered solely on the clinical, as good as I was. Um, it's really also about the community involvement too. So I didn't get a community contact. Instead, um, Mount Isa is kind of a hub for medical as well as allied health students. So we had um, OTs, physios, um, nurses, um, predominantly from James Cook. And there's about 20, 25 of us um, scattered around like five places. So this was my gang, the Stanley Street gang. And they were wonderful, awesome people. They really kept me involved with the community. We went for um, dinners together, cooked dinner together. We went to many events, hikes, walks. And it's, I guess the next few slides are really just boasting the sites that I saw. But really, um, went to this wonderful hike at this wonderful place called Mary Kathleen. And it's a beautiful place. Um, it's actually an ex-uranium mine. So um, if you want babies, don't swing in it. it was, lesson that we got otherwise um it was a ghost town attached to it further back too so that was you know cool experience in and of itself we also went to the mount isa races together so that was about 25 of us all going to the races and this is like just like the caulfield races it's a fanciful event everybody's in ridiculous clothes with ridiculous hats betting on ridiculous horses and um it's really fun you know winning some bets seeing your friends lose bets so you know cool environment for me otherwise um i wanted to I'm rushing through it a bit, but um, I wanted to, I was considering trying to convince you guys to pick JFPB, but I really recognize that everybody's experience is quite variable. 
but there's no guarantee that my experience will be similar to yours. So instead, I'm just going through some sort of lessons I learned through uh, on JPP. The first is that the weather is a pain. Queensland weather is a pain. Anyone that says Elsa is a liar. Um, but on the flip hand, um, they, they have a lot of pride in the weather, Queensland. And um, I find that patients like love to hear a Melbourne student suffering in the Queensland heat. So instant patient report if you need it. Otherwise, there are time differences between Australia. So don't run across an airport if you have an hour to spare. Otherwise, the real important thing is um, as well as that patient continuity is a gem. With decon placements, you only see a patient, you're only there for two to three hours and only for once. Whereas this was two weeks. So I saw patients many times over the two weeks. Some got better, some deteriorated and got much worse and really puts everything you learn to perspective and really puts a weight to the stuff that you actually learn. Otherwise, your nurses and your receptionists are lifesavers. Don't know if I need to overstate this, but literally, you know, befriend them. They will save you so many times. Otherwise, stay safe. I went through the summer holidays. Um, there was a bit of um, breaking to houses and a bit of um, joyriding that happened to one of the other students, her car when we got smashed. So no, it's a different environment. It's a different culture that you need to be aware and you need to take care of yourself too. Otherwise, just enjoy the ride, roll the punches. Once again, every experience is different. So if the opportunity presents itself, you know, have a go. Just be open-minded. But that was a quick snapshot. Definitely not as awesome as Edwina's and much more privileged. But that was my mini JPP. Once again, just no questions. So it's all good, yeah. Super awesome. cool, Kevin. Um, I think Kevin was being a little modest about his experience. Yeah, uh, exactly. It was wonderful. Yeah, like your text messages and your phone calls. Kevin was actually like really, really, really happy um, at his placement. Let me just try to find out how to do this. Um, so I think my placement was unique in that I was privileged enough to have all three contacts. So I had a mentor a host and a community contact so i had a pretty like full-on um how do i describe it a full-on like community activity thing going on with mine um anyways my name is monica and i was fortunate enough to be um selected to partake into the jfp program and i chose wa just because i wanted to be closer to the water and I was like lucky enough to live at a doctor's house. So not necessarily my mentor's house, but like the house I lived in was owned by one of the doctors that I got to work with. And I lived like five minutes away from the beach um, in a town called Bunbury. So it's like a hundred kilometers from Perth. So it wasn't really that rural, to be honest. Um, it's sort of like the equivalent of Geelong from Melbourne. Um, yeah, so my mentor was um, Dr. Jude DeCruz, and he worked in a very large medical center. Um, I think there were about like 30 GPs in the center. Um, I guess every, like most GPs had their own little niche and Dr. Jude DeCruz's niche was mental health and um, drug and alcohol like um, addiction. So a lot of the patients I got to see were predominantly people in like chronic mental health care and people who were like struggling, um, I guess. Um, yeah, I personally found it a struggle to sort of observe that because like I personally just found it hard to deal with those patients. Um, but Jude let me also sit in with other GPs, which I thought was quite good. So I got a little bit of uh, women's health, pediatric health, as well as a bit of a alternative therapy doctor I got to observe. Um, I got to see down the pathology lab and as well as follow a physiotherapist for like half a day. Um, so I feel like I got a pretty good like um, rounded experience with mine. Um, and every Wednesday, Jude does a day specifically at a Headspace clinic. So I think Headspace is specifically for 18 to 25 year olds. Um, I got to see cases like, like with children struggling with depression, um, like their sexual identity. Um, bullying was a really big one, actually. Um, I was a bit surprised. 
Um, and I guess for me, I really enjoyed um, watching how Jude interacted with those children and um, sort of like counsel them through like their struggles and that stuff. Um, and then on Thursdays, like once a month, Jude has a day specifically for drug and alcohol. So there's a specific drug that is prescribed to people who have, um, who are weaning off like the hard drugs. Um, I think that drug has like certain side effects, including like neutropenia. So that's like um, a low white blood count. So I think for that day I was taking the, I was reading the patient's like blood cell report, taking their weight, height and blood pressure. So that was all I did for that day. And um, I got to talk to patients for a little while. Um, and I found it quite enjoyable. It's not as like um, nerve wracking as OSCEs. Um, I think it's more like you'd be surprised how much patients talk. Like I think when you guys are, when we're doing history taking class, like it's so hard to get information out of people, but like in real life, patients are really sweet. Like they want to tell you what's going on with them. Um, and a lot of them were really understanding that I was a, that I was a medical student and yeah, like they sort of made fun how I was like from Melbourne um, or, or from the East. Like that's how like WA people call it. But if you're like from Melbourne, Queensland, Sydney, you're like a person from the East. So it's like their own little country there. Um, yes, yeah, so that was that. And then like on Fridays, uh, Jude is involved with the after hours clinic. So um, every day of the week, that medical center has only one doctor that stays back from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, so for me, that day was an 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. day. Um, there was only a half an hour lunch break for me and 10 minutes of it was driving back home to have lunch. So I really only had like 10 minutes to eat that day. Um, and Drew only had like 10 minutes to eat that day too. Um, I saw him snacking a lot. Um, it was actually like quite interesting to see. Um, I like found it really hard just to sit there and watch him work. So I guess like um, being a GP requires stamina. Um, that was fun. Um, I really enjoyed the after hours clinic though, because because there are no nurses, no other doctors around, I got to be like a lot more hands-on with patients. Um, I got to do like, I got to put ECGs on patients, um, like examine a kid, like look inside his ear and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's a lot more hands-on, but the day was actually quite tiring. And in Bunbury, I think the sun sets by like seven or eight o'clock. So for me, I was already ready for bed by 8.30, nine o'clock most days. Um, and you find that in Bunbury, um, everyone goes to bed pretty early. Um, the supermarkets close around eight or nine o'clock. Um, a lot of the activities that occur in Bunbury occur like early in the morning or afternoon. So it's very like different vibe compared to Melbourne. Like we have like a very strong nightlife. Um, I think that's about it for my GP um, part. And the next slide is really just like, I just wanted to brag, but like Jude got me a car to drive for two weeks. Um, he, he didn't have to do that, but like he, yeah, like was so like nice and was like, you know, do you have a license? I said, yes. And he's like, you know, I want to get a car and also get you insurance for it. So he actually did that out of his own time and out of his own pocket. Um, and it just made getting around a lot more easier. Um, he really encouraged me to check out like the area because um, he said moving to Bunbury, like he'd been there for eight years and he quite liked it. Um, so with the car, like I actually got to go to the dolphin discovery center. Um, I got to see turtles, like apparently turtles wash up on the beach and people bring them in. And I went there alone, which, um, which was kind of sad, but like, it wasn't that bad. You get to talk to like the other, like people in the local community. And you find that everyone in Bunbury is like very nice. Um, yeah, they're all like really nice, um, really friendly. They'll tell you where to go, where do you like, what to do. And I was lucky enough to have like a community host 
who was a physio at that clinic as well. So I actually got to follow him for a while. Um, we went to have lunch, dinner at a pub, and we also got to watch movies. Um, so there's no village cinemas, no Hoyt cinemas at Bunbury. It's like, it's called Bunbury Cinema. And uh, um, I don't know, the food there was very like homemade. I don't know how to describe it, but it was very like, the standards are very different, but it felt like very homey, I guess. Um, there's no allocated seat numbers at the cinema. You sort of just sit wherever. And I got to meet like a radiotherapist and an OT while I was there. So I don't know, I got to meet a lot of people. I got to like actually do a lot of stuff. Um, my community, my host, so the lady I lived with, um, she had like kayaks and stuff. So she actually took me out and we went kayaking one morning and I was actually like really close to like a school of dolphins. So I actually nearly got to touch a dolphin, like it was in front of my face. So that was pretty interesting. Um, she, like her name was Sue and she was really sweet actually. Um, it took me like nine hours to get to Bunbury. So like four hour flight, um, three hour time difference, three hour train ride. I was in Perth for three hours waiting for the train. So I was actually like really tired, really cranky. Um, because I don't know, I, I don't actually enjoy traveling, like, you know, waiting so long. So that was hard. Um, but when I got to the house, I think Sue had already packed me like dinner and breakfast, like in a little bento box, like Korean chicken or whatnot. She's actually like a really good cook. So my time in Bunbury actually had all my meals like organized for me, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, she made her own bread. Um, we also like had our own hens, so roosters, wh whatever you call them. So I woke up around five or five thirty every morning, um, and honest and like without an alarm as well. Um, I felt like really healthy in Bunbury, um, and sort of like inner peace. I don't know how to describe it. It was just like I don't know. I felt like I was on a little retreat. Um, this woman was like feeding me like vegetables and like organic eggs, organic everything. Um, yeah, so I had that and I got to live with like, um, other sort of random people from like around Australia. So during dinner, like, I guess we had like pretty good dinner conversations. And I think one night, um, we had a doctor over for dinner and we also had one of the patients over. So like everyone sort of knows everyone in Bunbury and, um, you're never, I don't think you're actually ever alone in Bunbury. Um, it kind of got like a little too much for me because um, I'm sort of introverted, but like, nah, like um, as a, like overall, um, it was a pretty good experience. And um, I think that's all I have to say about it. I can't. Awesome. That's basically it. Thanks so much, Monica. It's all right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so why we wanted to, um, uh, share a few of our experiences is that just really goes to show that each of us had um, a very different experience. It's different across states, it's different across towns. Um, and I think Kevin um, really summed it up nicely saying that it is going to be different for everyone and it's really important to be aware of that and keep an open mind. Um, but yeah, so big thank you to uh, Kevin and Monica for coming in. I dragged them in to share their experience. Um, and also a massive uh, thank you to Lauren um, for giving us a bit of a rundown. Um, our Wave is a really kind of good organisation of support and resource. So give them a like on Facebook and stuff because they have a lot of great things coming our way and Nomad does like a lot of collaboration with them and in good contact with them. Um, so we have recorded this and we'll get the recording and I'll make sure I post those uh, videos that Lauren also wanted to include. Um, and some contact information as well for if you have some more specific questions for Lauren or myself or just want to hear a little bit more about um, our experiences as well. Um, and we'll be sure to make sure we um, share a bit of a reminder when applications open as well um, so that you guys don't miss out. Um, but I did, there wasn't really much else to add for this session. So yeah, get in contact if you have any questions and thank you so much for coming along everyone. And yeah, thank you so much for coming in to do 
um, the talk as well, Lauren. No worries, no worries, guys. Thanks so much for coming along. And yeah, great presentations from the JFPP students there. They were really, really fun. It's just the best part of doing these, um, hearing about your experiences. So thank you for sharing. Awesome. Okay, well, go about your Friday. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Enjoy PBL, everyone. And yeah, see you soon.